Alicia, should we go ahead and get started? I was just about to say that, yes. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that right. we can go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Well, I am Frank Morris with Clean Cities Georgia, and Alicia Lopez is with uh, Southeast Florida Clean Cities, South Florida Clean Cities, sorry Alicia, and uh, welcome to this webinar. And uh, uh, we've got the uh, housekeeping uh, slide up just for everyone to know that uh, we are recording this uh, webinar and to stay muted that we will uh, be hearing from several presenters and we have planned uh, plenty of time for them to present, but then also to allow for Q&A, which Alicia and I will be monitoring throughout the presentation and and save plenty of time at the end to take your questions. Please, uh, you can put your uh, questions in the chat or the question box and we will monitor, monitor those uh, going through the presentation. Next slide. And uh, next slide, thank you. So I am Frank Morris, the Executive Director for Clean Cities Georgia. Clean Cities is a national program. It's funded by the Department of Energy and uh, it has been in place uh, since the early 90s and uh, the things that we focus on are uh, advocating for alternative fuels in transportation and so we're proud to present this uh, cng for fleets presentation we've got a, a great bunch of folks to help us do that we've got david jaskowski for peach state trucks we've got don mccormick from waste management We've got Rodney Dill from the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia and Ian Skelton from Atlantic Gaslight. And also Dave, uh, is it Alicia, has Dave joined us from City Furniture? He is on. Okay, very good. So uh, both, of our, uh, both of our coalitions are conveners of uh, interested um, parties that are seeking to learn more about alternative fuels and transportation to improve their uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions, if you will, to improve their bottom line. And uh, we are fuel agnostic when it comes to uh, the fuels, whether it's propane, natural gas, electric, ethanol, biodiesel, hydrogen, uh, or any new fuel that might come along to replace uh, petroleum products. Uh, we are also grant managers, uh, helping fleets and the communities manage their grants and help them to win those grants. And we administer those grants through the DOE. Next slide. Coalition strategies are focused on fleets and also the individual and all the way from um, your personal car up to the heavy duty tractor trailer rigs going down the highways and using alternative fuels in those, prior, uh, in those uh, transportation uh, equipment. Uh, we also focus on different mobility choices and transportation technologies. Alicia and myself and, and many of the coalitions will often get calls from different uh, technology companies that they've got a solution to incorporate alternative fuels. And we help to connect those people with stakeholders and members of our coalitions and, and municipalities and individuals interested in learning more. We also manage idle reduction technologies uh, through DERA grants is one example of reducing idle uh, emissions of let's say diesel equipment in uh, uh, distribution yards and so forth. And then we're also just the whole infrastructure of alternative fuels, renewable fuels, and how that cycle works and how we can make those fuels more available, how we can make uh, folks uh, understand better, how they can connect with fueling alternatives, uh, where to find electric charging, where to find CNG fueling, uh, where to find uh, propane as an auto gas uh, for fueling. So those are some of the things that we work on as a coalition. Thank you. Thanks. This is just a, a quick look at uh, who supports uh, our team in Georgia, our board of directors, as you, you'll hear from uh, Ian earlier, or excuse me, later, and also David Jaskowski. You'll see that we've got folks on our uh, a team, uh, like Rodney, that represents the Municipal Gas, Gas Authority, excuse me. We've got fleet uh, managers, uh, Cobb County, DeKalb County. Got Georgia Power involved, uh, the end users of many of these fleets, uh, like um, UPS and the City of Atlanta, uh, Cox Enterprises, uh, gives you a good example of uh, um, 
who we are and, and who helps support us and, and brings uh, great knowledge to uh, help us share that with, uh, with uh, our stakeholders. Next slide. So when we talk about working with municipalities, we're able to recommend alternative fuels policy, connect them with, um, with national programs when it comes to funding opportunities and also coaching municipalities. Uh, we also take advantage of the, the municipalities that are out front and have done a great job in vehicle conversions to talk to other municipalities about this is sort of what they've learned from their programs and how uh, municipalities can also adopt uh, the same type of technology and, and alternative fuels in their fleets. Next slide. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alicia Lopez from Southeast Florida Clean Cities Coalition. Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you again for joining the webinar today. My name is Alicia and I'm the coordinator for the Southeast Florida Clean Cities Coalition. And a little bit about our coalition, we're actually housed in the South Florida Regional Planning Council, which is in Hollywood, Florida. Our region covers Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, and Monroe counties. And we work pr pretty much the same as Frank mentioned, you know, helping with conversions to alternative fuels, any outreach, education, um, helping with grant opportunities. So please feel free to always reach out to your local coalition if you guys have any questions in regards to any, like I said, alternative fuels. And then on our board, we have um, Jeff Roth from ChargePoint, Dave Clevenger, who you will actually hear from today from City Furniture, who has been a stakeholder for uh, many years. And as well as we just recently welcomed Commissioner Bean Fur from Broward County. So he has a very big track record, especially in the city of Hollywood with pushing alternative fueling and any sustainability efforts. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dave Clevenger from City Furniture, who is an end user of CNG, who's gonna discuss a little bit about their, their process and kind of how they helped work and using the fuel. Dave, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself so that we can get started. I don't think it, it, I have it up. Uh, could not get on the webinar through the computer, so I'm working off a of phone. So we're dealing with technology today. A um, little bit about City Furniture. City Furniture uh, is a 50 year old company. We're actually celebrating our 50th year this year. Uh, we're a retail distribution uh, furniture um, business out of South Florida, now growing into Central and North Florida. We have uh, approximately 151 delivery trucks, all CNG eight tractors now that are running CNG and two yard spotters that we've uh, ventured out into the electric field. We got a, a couple of Ottawa electric spotters, a couple of the first ones in the country. Um, just to give you a little brief how we got into the alternative fuel system. Around 2012, my owners, uh, Keith uh, Koenig and Andrew Koenig decided, you know, they started looking to the future and uh, we were running all diesel, putting uh, many miles on our vehicles, and decided it was time to look into what's in the future. And the future was alternative fuels for us. So they gave me the task in 2012, said, hey, Dave, good, yeah, we got something great for you. I'm like, okay, here comes a pink slip or something coming. But he goes, no, we got a challenge for you. Find us an alternative fuel to run our vehicles on to make our, us cleaner and greener. We're going to we're, uh, started opening all our stores and uh, locations being LEED certified. And part of that is to change over to alternative fuels and, uh, and make it a cleaner environment for our delivery process as well. So I researched for about a year and uh, went through every, everything I could find because I'm a retired veteran. I started, I got my first paycheck at 14 years old working on diesel vehicles. I'm a diesel, I was a diesel guy through and through down to my bone. So researching everything, I was like, wow, this is gonna be tough. I don't understand too much uh, about this alternative fuel system. And so I did a lot of learning, a lot of uh, going out, seeing different companies, a lot of uh, waste rest refuge up north and to see just what we could do for our vehicles. So I decided on, uh, compressed natural gas. Then the challenge really began because in our field, we need we need mid-level vehicles, we medium duty vehicles, and there was just nothing out there. Um, 
couldn't find a medium duty delivery truck anywhere. So that began the first part of the challenge. Second part of the challenge. Dave, I think we just lost your audio. So I thought I was on a losing battle here. So I worked with a company out of uh, Leesville, out of uh, Louisiana, uh, uh, Eagle Trucking, developed a, a truck, a medium duty truck for our needs, and that was in uh, Zuzu NPR HD. Um, set research, helped develop it about six months, and finally got it. We finally got a vehicle in here that would work for us. It was smaller, it didn't hold as much capacity, but it, it would work for our, our needs. So we started out with five dedicated, five dedicated CNG vehicles. And I finally, I, I realized we were running out of fuel on the road a lot. This was not gonna work back to the drawing board. So I had to find a bi-fuel system. We developed that through with a momentum, uh, uh, system fuel system and then I said wow where are we going to fill up so we had to get a station so we built our station in 2013 opened it up private company our own station here on in Tamarack got a uh, two compressor four stage compressors through true star started that process which is another uh, challenge but we overcame it and we learned a lot from that so today we uh, we're running the CNG station here at Tamarack have been running since 2013. We have 50 fill posts with two fill lines on each. We we're able to fill our trucks overnight, time fill, and also uh, do quick fills throughout the day. Um, it We have went through a lot of challenges throughout the years, learned a lot, learned tremendous amount. Um, had to realize that um, you know, we have to teach our technicians. We didn't have many technicians around the area to re repair our vehicles. So put to, put our technicians through training. We learned also we had to uh, build a shop to uh, be able to work on those vehicles. So we converted our shop over to CNG, um, able to use CNG inside the shop itself, which was a, another challenge. But We've also learned a lot in that, this time frame of the cost savings, the environmental savings, the the uh, better aspect for our vehicles. The vehicles actually run cleaner, better. Our drivers actually like them a lot better. Um, as you see on the slide there, average use uh, is approximately 80,000 um, gas gallons equivalent. Um, and then we're using about 29,000 gallons of gasoline on that buy side. The range for us was the biggest challenge. We have a 32 gallon tank on on our uh, on our CNG trucks, but we're running outside of areas. We run anywhere from mile marker zero in the Keys all the way up to and including St. Petersburg, Tampa area, things like that. So we had to get that range get back and forth, which which uh, necessitated the gasoline buy fuel on there. But we're using that to the to a to the smallest amount possible, and we're actually getting it done. We're doing over 400,000 miles monthly. All right, uh, cost of CNG right now, compared to gasoline, it, it's right at half. I mean, you can't beat it with a 62.52% savings just on, just on the delivery trucks themselves. We've added our eight tractors recently, within the last two years, we started transferring process because we opened a DC in uh, a Coe. Florida up by Orlando. So we're transferring back and forth. I worked out a deal with Peterbilt to get a uh, dedicated CNG tractor through them with a Cummins near zero in it. And I can't explain how happy I am with this vehicle. We're uh, running back and forth eight loads a night to the um, Orlando area, dedicated CNG, no issues there, up and back four times on, on a single fill up a CNG. It's worked out tr uh, tremendous force on cost-wise, uh, cost of fuel, maintenance cost is lower. Um, it's just a win, win, win. Um, we started out our cost 
there's one of the issues where my where I was really really concerned, and I think any any new uh, anybody who's looking to start up a CNG fleet or or build your own station, the initial cost is kind of staggering at first, but when you you work it all out and get the ROI on it, it works itself out, and ROI is pretty quick. We initially started our first CNG station, it cost about 1.2, um, and then to convert our vehicles to an extra 20 grand on top of what a, what the cost of the vehicle is initially. Um, the training cost, as I said, for the mechanics about 500 bucks uh, to get to get the technicians understanding um, the natural gas the CNG applications for the vehicles. Um, but it all works itself out. And the maintenance cost on on uh, station for us is the routine maintenance. This is not the annual or the the quarterly um, services on the CNG station. So, but it's about eight thousand dollars. That's your oils. That's your daily upkeep. That's um, just maintaining daily maintaining of the station. Um, the PM uh, PM cost for our vehicles that drop. You know, it's eighty eight. Uh, for the CNG is about 81.25 less than uh, standard vehicle. We're, for me to have one of my techs service one of our CNG vehicles, it's about thirty dollars. That's the oil change, that's your filters, that's going through doing everything, and time of the of uh, labor. When it was averaging about 164, uh, 84 for me to do the same PM on one of our diesel vehicles, so the maintenance cost has come down. The fuel cost has come down. We have our own stations here at a, and at a Tamarack, so the convenience is there. Uh, the, our operators like the CNG vehicles, how they ride, how they drive, everything uh, a lot better than they did the diesels. So it's a win-win-win-win situation. So City Furniture were quite happy with our alternative fuel vehicles. We love the conversion over to convert uh, uh, CNG and alternative fuel so much that we've dedicated that in our in our 2040 carbon neutral pledge, which uh, the city is one of our pledges for city furniture corporate, that we are determined never to go back to uh, anything. We're never going to use or buy anything but an alternative fuel vehicle. We're reaching out into the electric field. But that we know right now that that's not ready for our application. It's going to be a few years before that. But we're we're doing we're reaching out trying to find any new alternative fuel system vehicles that we can do or buy. Um, boom! You, uh, there's a lot of benefits to the to uh, the alternative fuel. You get your yearly grants through the state of Florida. Florida, you know. And we work on that and we have a committee that makes sure that we uh, keep updated on all grants uh, for the vehicles themselves, uh, all the grants for building our stations. And uh, right now we're building another DC in Miami Gardens, Florida. We're starting uh, with True Star. They break ground next month on that uh, CNG station. We've opened a new DC in Ocoee, Florida. They break ground, they broke ground, I'm sorry, last week on that station. And starting July, well, no, we'll be open in July. That by January, we'll break ground for the uh, CNG station in Tampa or Plant City, Florida, on our new million uh, three hundred square foot DC in that area. Uh, we committed to every DC that we open, we will have. Uh, a CNG station operating there, along with charging stations for electric vehicles. So the Koenigs have put a ton of money into what they believe is the right decision, helping the helping uh, with environmental, getting the best product out to our customer, and doing it in the cleanest way we possibly can. And I, I couldn't give them more credit at all. Because this this came out straight out of pocket in the beginning. They made the commitment. They they stood by what they said when they want a clean environment, and they uh, actually paid for everything and got it rolling. So I could be prouder to, uh, to work for a company like City Furniture, and um, 
hope to be with them a few more years until I retire and I develop a little better, cleaner, not only fleet, but facilities and everything, every aspect of our business. Right now, that's about all I got. And I apologize again for the technical difficulties. That's one thing that we, I'll have to work on as well. But for this uh, presentation, that's about all I got for it right now. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask, answer any questions you may have as able as we go along. Thank you, Dave. I'm going to go ahead and um, pass it over to Don. And Don, go right ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Dave, thank you for that and for the good work that City Furniture has done. You've really been a leader in that in that area, and we really appreciate it. Thank you, too, for your service for our country. Um, I'm pleased to be the Director of Communications and Government Affairs for Waste Management in Florida. I'm real proud to talk about RCNG for Fleets project uh, in North America, and then I'll focus specifically on Florida and Georgia. So the, this slide coming up shows us about our footprint for waste management in North America. We have just shy of 50,000 employees. We are a Fortune 250 company. Uh, we have over now 10,000 alternative fuel vehicles, uh, 171 natural gas fueling stations, and in uh, 104 of our situations, we use landfill gas to energy facilities. I just highlight that because we're also doing it in our post collections facilities. But this presentation is really going to focus on our collection vehicles and our use of alternative fuels. I also want to highlight a little bit of our overall sustainability goals. Alicia, that's the next slide. In 2038, uh, waste management set an ambitious goal to uh, set offset four times our greenhouse gas emissions that we generate by 2038. And to do that, we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2%, a little over 2% every year. And uh, we also have people goals about making our communities in which we work safe, resilient, and sustainable. Uh, when you look a little shorter term, our 2025 goals is that 70% of our collection fleet will be using alternative fuels by 2025. We're well on our way to meeting that goal. And 50% uh, of our alternative fuel vehicles will run on renewable natural gas. We're not doing that in Florida, but we are doing it elsewhere around the country. And then also at our locations, 100% renewable energy at the sites that we control uh, by waste management. So overall, when you look at our larger fleet numbers across uh, the country, and that's the next slide, Alicia, uh, we have 17,000 trucks uh, in our portfolio to service our uh, 20 million customers. Our drivers drive about 450 million miles every year. I'm real proud to say that about 85% of our new truck purchases are all natural gas vehicles. And uh, we've reduced our emissions to date by 36% when you look at uh, 2010 to 2019. So we're well on our way to meeting many of our goals. And that other map just shows you where we have uh, RNG facilities around the country. You'll see that we don't have them in Florida, but we have them elsewhere. And we have a big commitment to expanding our renewable natural gas portfolio. Company-wide on our closed loop fueling system, just highlight a couple of these numbers on this slide. Uh, 350,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions is what our company has reduced, and we do that annually through the use of natural gas and RNG fuel. And we are replacing about 1.07 billion diesel gallon, gallons of fuel over uh, that useful life of these facilities and of other those trucks. So really proud of those major reductions uh, in both uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the use of diesel. And right now, um, not in Florida, but a lot of on the West Coast, we have 5,000 natural gas vehicles that are fueled by landfill gas or actually gas produced from an animal manure. So we're doing a lot of innovative things in this field and uh, pleased to continue to look at alternative uh, fuels for our vehicles. If you want to take a look at the map here, this is a map of where we have a footprint of CNG and LNG, and that spans 36 states. Uh, we continue to expand. Uh, 8,900 trucks, we're now up to over 10,000, I said on the earlier slide. 
Again, 60% of our fleet is uh, alternative fuels, and we have 171 fueling stations, 25 of which around the country are uh, public access. Uh, we do that where we can. We can't do it everywhere, but uh, we, we try to make them public access if we can. This slide uh, shows, um, I think, what, something we all know about the environmental benefits of our CNG fleet. Uh, each truck reduces diesel. We save 8,000 gallons of fuel per year. We cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions 21%, which is about 22 metric tons for each uh, vehicle. Uh, the reduction in carbon monoxide is 80%, 25% carbon dioxide emission reduction, and 30% nitric oxygen um, or nitrogen oxides. This uh, slide shows you our slow fill or uh, time fill station in uh, Pompano Beach. We have slots there for 200 of our vehicles. It's one of our uh, most active, largest uh, collection districts in the state of Florida in Pompano Beach serving Broward County. And that site is very, very active. And that is our time fill location. Overall, when you look at our CNG fleet in Florida and Georgia, we have 1,150 uh, CNG trucks in Florida. That's 58% of our fleet. Uh, 343 in Georgia, 34% of our fleet. Uh, we're all uh, in line for capital from our corporate headquarters in Houston, so it's uh, often a battle to get that, that those dollars, but uh, we've, we've done a good job in Florida of, of changing over our fleet. And uh, again, 85% of our future buy is all uh, alternative fuel CNG trucks. When you look at our fueling stations, um, there are about there are 14 in Florida, 14 in Georgia. Um, the photo here is of our public station in Pompano Beach. Uh, we have that along with the time fill, and this is open to um, at this point mostly fleets. Uh, other fleets uh, utilize this station, and uh, it is the only uh, public station in Florida that we've been able to build to this point. But we do continue to look for opportunities to do so as we're building stations. Uh, the next slide shows the map of where our CNG facilities are throughout Florida. So take a look if you're interested in specifically, specifically where we're at. We are currently building a site in Jacksonville and also one in Martin County, Hope Sound. So this year we'll be adding two more. So the total investment waste management has made in CNG in Florida and Georgia is about $500 million in Florida, $200 million in Georgia when you take our vehicles and our fueling stations all together. And uh, just really pleased about the commitment the company's made towards CNG and alternative fuel. And I'll look forward to answering any questions at the end of the webinar. And I'm pleased to turn it over uh, to Dave right now. So thank you all. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Jeskowski. I'm responsible for Advanced Technology Vehicle Centers at Peach State Truck Centers in Norcross, Georgia. Next slide. Established in 1974, we're a very large company representing a lot of different brands. I'll show on the next slide. Including Freightliner and Ford Commercial Vehicles. To our friends in Florida, uh, we have connections with dealers throughout Florida. And if you see something that of interest in this presentation, feel free to reach out to me and I can help you connect you with the right dealer. Next slide. We're gonna start looking at some of the Ford commercial vehicle C and G options. Uh, Ford offers a very, very wide array of C and G vehicles. And when I say CNG, also remember anything that's CNG can use RNG, renewable natural gas. It's, it's a direct replacement. And in the correct applications and correctly equipped, LNG, liquefied natural gas. Ford produces the truck to be ordered with a CNG gaseous engine prep package. And then the vehicles are upfitted with tanks and other equipment by what's called a qualified vehicle modifier. And they are the ones that are gonna install the tanks in the hardware. It's important to remember as we look at this truck, these trucks that when it's converted to CNG, Ford maintains the engine and the powertrain warranty. Only the modifier is responsible for the tanks. Next slide. 
So let's look at some of the trucks that are actually available in a wide variety of applications. First is the F-250 and F-350 pickup. These are commonly found in class two, class three vehicle operations. When we say vehicle class, what we're talking about is what the vehicle weight rating is. And so if I'm talking about a class two vehicle, I'm talking about things that are 6,000 to 10,000 pounds, gross vehicle weight rating, class three is 10,000 to 14,000 pounds. Next slide. We also offer this in a chassis cab. So where the pickup cab is appropriate, but you need something other than a pickup bed, a specialized body, let's say for air conditioning service where they're keeping their tools on the side, this is the type of truck we offer. Next slide. And then there's the E-Series cutaway. Now this actually goes up in the gross vehicle weight rating class to class three and class so now we're getting up to a vehicle that can handle 14,000 pounds. Um, these are in a wide variety of applications, anything from what you see a moving van to airport shuttles and hotel shuttles. Next slide. Now let's get into some of the bigger vehicles offered by Ford, the F F650 and F750 cabin chassis. Um, these are rated now up to 30. 3,000 pounds. So we're, we're getting into class seven trucks. Next slide. Also very popular for CNG is what we call the strip chassis for parcel vans. So the vans that you see in your neighborhood commonly with companies like UPS and Amazon delivering parcels, we, we can sell them the chassis and then upfit it with the body and they run it on CNG. It's a great application. Next slide. We're going to shift gears now and look at some of the offerings that come from Freightliner. Freightliner in the class seven, class eight market is the number one supplier of trucks, about 34, 35% of the market share. First one we're going to take a look at is the M2 112 natural gas truck. And this can be equipped either as a truck, which hauls its load on its back with some sort of a body, or as in this picture, a tractor, something that pulls a trailer. So we use the word truck interchangeably, but if it hauls a load on its back, it's a truck. If it pulls a trailer, it's known as a tractor. You can see behind the cab, the stack of CNG tanks that were installed. This is an agility package um, and gives a truck great range. Next slide. The M2-112 can be a class seven or eight. It comes with Cummins L9N power. Cummins is one of the first builders of diesel engines and they've been in business for probably a hundred years and they build a great natural gas engine. We offer it in the M2-112 from 250 to 320 horsepower and up to a thousand pounds feet of torque combined with an Allison 3000 or 4000 transmission. And it is available in a wide variety of cabs, a day cab, an extended cab, which can have a sleeper and crew cab models. Next slide. Now we're gonna look at something different. This is what we call a severe duty truck. The severe duty designation means this thing is gonna get beat up. It's gonna go off highway such as an application with a dump truck. So you're loading it with dirt, taking it to a job site, and then it's a rough job site. So they are really tough built trucks. Next slide. These get a little larger in size, uh, still class seven or eight. Um, now we can offer in this, in addition to the Cummins L9N, a larger ISX 12 n So we can go to a 12 liter engine. And that means we're, we can go to additional horsepower up to 400 and additional torque up to 1,450 foot pounds. Um, available with Allison 3000 and 4000 automatic transmissions. We can get it as a day cab, extended cab with a sleeper option and crew cabs. Next slide. And now the big daddy, the tractor trailer, the Freightliner CNG Cascadia. This has been a tremendous success for Freightliner nationwide. Um, SEA had a recent pro uh, 
a major freight company had a release where they're deploying five of these out in California, and they run throughout the country. Next slide. These are designed as a tractor, so it's always going to have a trailer behind it. It's a class eight vehicle and designed for 80,000 pounds gross combined weight. That's the, the tractor, the trailer, the payload, everything. And that's the maximum you can put on the road. Um, there is an exemption and now I think for an additional 2,000 pounds, which the vehicle is capable of. It comes with a Cummins ISX 12N engine, which we talked about in the previous slide, with 400 horsepower and 1,450 foot-pounds of torque. That means the truck can operate anywhere in the United States, including in the mountains. It's available with both manual and automated transmissions up to 18 speeds. And just a note, an automated transmission is a manual transmission that shifts itself, different than an automatic transmission. It's taken some years, but now the software is configured where it's a perfect match for a CNG engine. Day cab and sleeper configurations up to 72 inch, and that's the size of the sleeper. And lightweight options for wheels, axle carries, and fifth wheels. Since a CNG tractor is slightly heavier than a conventional diesel tractor, we can add different options, such as the wheels, axle carries, and fifth wheel, that bring that weight back down and keep things in parity. CNG options are available to order today. From small delivery vans to Class A tractor trailers, these are proven trucks, factory built, that you can order right now. Um, at our dealership and many dealerships throughout Georgia and Florida, there are technicians that are trained to work on CNG and the parts availability is excellent. CNG is just a great fit for a wide variety of applications. Next slide. And so here's my contact information. If you have any questions on vehicle availability, either in Georgia or Florida, reach out to me and I'll be happy to make sure we get you connected with the right people. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Rodney Dill with the Municipal, Municipal Gas Authority. Hey, great. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Rodney Dill with the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia. Um, I'm the Director of Member Services and Communications with the Authority, and I'm, I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, let me first of all just I uh, want to want to thank uh, both Frank and Alicia uh, for organizing this, and um, just the value to right out of the gate here, just emphasize the value of, of clean cities. I know uh, from our perspective, uh, the municipal perspective, uh, you know, certainly looking at clean cities or toward clean cities is that organization that can, uh, you know, help us locate grant opportunities, uh, certainly the networking and understanding um, how, uh, you know, different fleets have uh, incorporated um, really any alternative fuels, but uh, especially CNG in our case, has been been very helpful. So uh, just a shout out to the Clean Cities organization, uh, both in Florida and Georgia. Alicia, next slide there. Let me give you a little background on the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia. We are uh, what's called a joint natural gas joint action agency. And uh, really what that means is that we represent uh, municipally owned natural gas distribution systems. We've got 80 municipal members in our organizations throughout uh, five states, uh, mainly in Georgia. And uh, the primary purpose of our organization is, uh, is to provide natural gas supply uh, for these uh, municipally owned and operated distribution systems. Uh, so you can see a little bit of a profile of our organization. If you collectively consider us, we're uh, right at 260,000 customers. And, um, and you can see our mission there. And also too, we get in, we provide key services for the municipals in our organization uh, beyond gas supply and asset management, uh, rate design and forecasting, industrial customer support, marketing and communications and business development, which gets into CNG and the transportation sector. Great, thanks Alicia. Here's a little bit of a, of a profile. You can see here the um, interstate pipelines here, the blue that comes in through the, through the state into our state, into Georgia. And, uh, and then you can see uh, also too where uh, Barely, but you can see where a lot of our municipals are, are actually located. Um, the municipally owned uh, distribution system, um, you can, uh, there's actually about 84, there are 84 in Georgia and 64 belong to our organization. I think there's 22 in Florida. And um, 
just the as as you look at the unique position of the municipal, especially the municipally owned uh, gas distribution system, um, you have the municipal certainly which operates and manages fleets, and uh, certainly those as you look at a fleet profile that can be comprised of transit systems, uh, refuse, um, heavy duty vehicles, uh, medium and light duty. Um, and then again, in the county government, you get the school buses, but uh, the typical profile is that these are uh, your know, return to base vehicles going out short distance and, um, and then um, returning back to a, to a base. And so that is a typical profile for the municipal. And then, um, you know, again, as I mentioned, the unique position of the distribution of owning and operating a distribution system is being able to to you know get the gas at a wholesale wholesale price. And so again, very very uniquely positioned uh, to incorporate CNG fleets within to the you know, within to the municipal enterprise. Uh, just a little bit of of um, you know talking about the benefits of of doing this. You've already heard uh, some great presentations in terms of cost savings and maintenance savings and um, the lower carbon footprint, lower emissions footprint, uh, all tremendous drivers in terms of, of doing this. Just to add a couple other things as far as municipals are considered, um, you know, one of the, you know, certainly one of the things that municipal really look at is lowering the tax cost for the citizens, uh, strategies to promote economic development. Uh, so you're, you're looking at, you know, having a CNG, uh, CNG operation um, there within the community certainly can be added to that economic development uh, mix in terms of enhancing the, the local retail product and, and recruitment of industry. So, so those are additional uh, advantages of, of having CNG or alternative fuels within the, within the municipal. Next slide, Alicia. Um, back up just one slide, Alicia. I wanted just to show to the public stations. I meant to cover that. You can see the four yellow dots. Here's four uh, public stations that are in Georgia. Uh, the top dot there in the northern uh, part, this is a municipally owned and operated CNG station, the city of Covington, uh, Georgia, located on I-20. Uh, in central Georgia, this is a privately owned uh, CNG station, AMP CNG, which serves a lot of the Frito-Lay uh, tractors uh, coming out of Warner Robins or Kathleen, Georgia. And, um, and so this, the, this is served by a municipal gas system, this particular station. Uh, serves AMP CNG. Uh, in, the, in the bottom section there, as you move down uh, to Douglas, Georgia, Douglas, Georgia, this is another example of a, of a municipally owned and operated uh, CNG station. Uh, the, the anchor fleet there for that particular station is uh, GFL Environmental, the subsidiary being Trans Waste. And uh, we, I'll talk in just a minute about strategic partnerships and the import of that, but here's where uh, Douglas was able to construct that station through a partnership with uh, GFL Trans Waste uh, located on Highway 441 there in Douglas. The bottom left-hand corner, Southwest Georgia, uh, Thomasville uh, Refuel CNG is the public station. They also have a privately owned uh, station as well, but uh, but this is another example where the the city has, has leased the space from a private owner to be able to provide uh, natural gas or CNG to the to the public. Next slide. Here, just an example. Uh, you can see uh, where we uh, try to track uh, track the uh, the GGEs uh, that are, are sold on a on a rolling twelve basis. So. Um, and, and again, this is just gives you a little bit of a trend from our organization's uh, perspective, but there's 14 active stations, the four public stations I just referenced, and then the 10 private stations, which are really a combination of both uh, the municipal uh, privately owned station, but also too behind the municipal distribution system, uh, we've got organizations like, uh, you know, like Frito, like, like UPS, uh, that actually have uh, own and operate stations in the municipal assembly, the gas provider, so a very different model. But you can see tracking the total GGE starting in January 14 and how the, the great upward trend there and how, the, you know, you can see the traction in terms of uh, station development and uh, all, all the way up now to around two, yeah, around two, 2.2, 2.3 million GGEs a, a year. I uh, talked about uh, different enterprise, uh, CNG enterprise models, just to get into a little more detail with that. The, the public uh, CNG stations, I had uh, referenced there, the, the private ownership of the AMP CNG station, and then the municipal ownership. Uh, you know, again, we've uh, 
you know, talked about that too as well, and also the public private ownership. Some specific gas authority programs that's helped really kind of foster some of these, these stations. Uh, certainly we referenced the one strategic partnership there in Douglas, but uh, again, as you as the municipals consider um, municipal distribution systems or the municipal itself really considers uh, operating a station, uh, you know, anchor fleets and strategic partnerships are critical to the, you know, to uh, getting one off the ground and getting one going. Uh, we actually, through our organization, are able to, to do project financing. So both the Douglas and Covington station, uh, we were able to finance both of those projects uh, uh, through the authority uh, to get those off the ground. And, um, and again, and yeah, thanks. I'll go to the next slide there. But yeah, I wanted to give three examples of, of uh, three uh, cities uh, within our organization. One is the city of Albany, Georgia. Uh, you know, currently as you look at at, uh, at the transit, here's an example of a transit system uh, where uh, they've incorporated uh, 15 transit buses and the uh, paratransit buses into their uh, into their transit system. So it's, it's, it's fully a CNG system. And you can see the Albany fleet, over 1,200 vehicle assets there. This was actually done through, through a grant. Um, and um, you can see the, the fuel consumption there uh, in Albany and, and also future discussions with Darty County on the, the, the county school system and, the, and school, uh, school buses and, and other vehicles within the county, uh, possibly leading to a potential public refuel station there in Albany, Georgia. So as you, uh, again, just to talk about some of the drivers, uh, you know, and you, you've heard it through uh, city furniture, through, through waste management, through those presentations, certainly for, as our municipal fleets have looked at this, it's been cost savings really has been the driver. Uh, you saw the differential between the, the diesel um, and uh, GGE equivalent. Uh, that, you know, for us, it's been, uh, the, the GGE equivalent has been anywhere from, from 60 cents to a dollar. So you can compare that to current diesel prices and gasoline prices and you can see very quickly the savings. Also, too, just the carbon carbon footprint was mentioned. I think Dawn mentioned over 21% savings in greenhouse gas emissions, and and also the uh, saving or the uh, NOx emission reductions are a tremendous benefit. Next slide. Here's the Thomasville CNG fleet. A little bit of a profile there: nine refuse vehicles, uh, dump truck, commuter bus, and you can see. I think it was Dave that mentioned some of the um, these uh, light and, and medium duty vehicles as well. Uh, the uh, what really kind of launched out to the public station was it was building the private station first for for the refuse operation, and um, and so you can see how this community went and actually branded the uh, their CNG operation uh, refuel CNG. City of Statesboro, Georgia. Um, here's the a profile of the Statesboro CNG fleet uh, uh, refuse vehicles. Again, some of the light duty biofuel uh, vehicles there that you see both can operate on CNG um, and, uh, and other fuel. And then the, uh, one of their drivers, as I've already mentioned, fuel savings and lower maintenance cost. Uh, one thing I'll mention too, just the performance issues of, of CNG. One of the things, uh, the, I know the, the, the fleet drivers were a little nervous about operating the CNG as they, they went into the uh, experiencing this, but uh, but the but the more that they operate them, they certainly the you know the noise issues, the performance, uh, uh, you know, lowering the noise pollution. I think around 10 decibels or so for some of these larger refuse vehicles, and then also too, um, they just really began to really request these vehicles, and uh, it was kind of interesting to kind of watch as we interviewed some of the some of the fleet drivers. The um, uh, again just. Uh, uh, you know, just really a testimony, I think, to the, to the CNG performance and how they, how they operate. One thing I'll mention too here is uh, to the uh, alternative fuels tax credit, uh, which is currently extended through 2021 is the 50 cent per GGE tax credit as a municipal um, being tax exempt entities, you can receive if you are dispensing the fuel uh, as either a retailer or for your private fleet, uh, you can get this back in the form of a rebate. Uh, so I know that's been extended to, through 2021, so I'm not sure of the, the, the future of that, but at least at least for this year, uh, you can get that rebate back as a municipal operator. So really just in summary, I would say as a municipal, um, you know, whether 
you are a gas provider or not, I think there's advantages in terms of the municipal fleet. I think you've heard several of the advantages. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, these being being returned to base, I think I would just emphasize the flexibility of being able to provide the fueling infrastructure that best meets your fleet needs. And and uh, and that can that can flex up or down, you know, depending uh, on, on your needs. And then also to just looking for anchor fleet opportunities in terms of a public station, extremely important. So I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards, but uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ian Skelton. Let me just mention that Atlanta Gaslight has been a, an important partner with our organization in terms of design, development, and maintenance. And so with that, Ian, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rodney. I appreciate that. Appreciate your participation on the Clean Cities Georgia Board, as well as uh, Dave uh, Piskowski, of course, who's also on our board, and, and Frank, our uh, coordinator. Um, and I also would like to start out by commending both uh, Dave with City Furniture and Dawn with Waste Management for their involvement and, and their company's uh, leadership in the alternative fuel space. Uh, we couldn't do any of this without the fleets. They're the ones that have to commit and engage to purchase alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, CNG trucks and, and uh, uh, fueling infrastructure. So uh, we, we just really couldn't be prouder uh, to support their efforts in uh, the important work they're doing. Next slide, please. So uh, AGL is a, um, a utility, Atlanta Gaslight uh, here in Georgia. Uh, we're part of the Southern Company and um, we have uh, We've been in the CNG space for, for many, many years. We got started with this back in uh, really the, the, the 80s when we started doing conversions on our own vehicles. And then in the 90s, we created a customer facing program where we started building CNG stations for our, um, our fleet customers. So we can provide the whole um, CNG value chain, uh, soup to nuts. We, can deliver the gas to the customer's uh, uh, premises, uh, build and, and maintain the stations, and of course support their, their efforts in the, the, the CNG market. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just an aerial drone footage of our uh, CNG maintenance shop. Uh, we're co-located with our fleet uh, management team in the Clayton Service Center in South Atlanta. Um, this is where we base our portable equipment, uh, monitor the uh, CNG stations with our remote management application and have a, a pretty well stocked uh, warehouse of spare parts and materials to maintain CNG uh, stations for our customers. And, you know, I'm going to talk mainly about uh, infrastructure today, but I want to start out by uh, with a few general points regarding CNG. Uh, it's important to note that CNG can work very well in uh, a lot of applications, but it's important to focus on locations and vehicles uh, that use a lot of fuel and, and return to a central location primarily um, because you've got some uh, upfront costs in terms of the fueling infrastructure that you need to cover and the, the higher uh, the throughput through that uh, station the quicker the payback, as well as the return on the incremental cost of the vehicles. So, you know, city vehicles, service uh, vehicles, meter reading vehicles, of course, are ideal candidates. Um, we have some 300 CNG vehicles in our own fleet. And then, of course, the, the other applications, uh, transit, trucking, um, waste, uh, are, are also ideal candidates because they uh, tend to be centrally fueled and fixed route type of vehicles. If you have a well-developed public CNG fueling infrastructure, then you can you can branch out in, in other types of fleets that maybe not um, so, so fixed route based. Uh, but if you don't have public infrastructure in the area, then it's key to, to be able to fuel your own vehicles at a central location. Next slide, please. I do want to elaborate a little more on the, uh, the Cummins heavy duty engines. Uh, in addition to the vehicles that uh, Dave covered, uh, offered through Ford, uh, and the, the heavy duty vehicles uh, that um, he mentioned, uh, the Freightliner uh, trucks and, and, uh, and the um, 
other vehicles that are available today are primarily using the, the, the Cummins heavy duty engines in the very uh, largest size range. Uh, the whole lineup of, of Cummins engines has, has now been uh, redeveloped and rebranded. Uh, they made some improvements to reduce the, um, the NOx emissions from uh, down to 0.02 grams of NOx per horsepower hour. That is 90% cleaner than the current EPA standard. And um, this is a big deal, particularly in uh, areas that are struggling to um, stay out of non-attainment with EPA for uh, ground level ozone, uh, since NOx is a precursor to ozone. Uh, the Cummins folks have an excellent uh, tool on their website where you can go and, and search all the different manufacturers of uh, heavy duty vehicles and which ones offer CNG, which models are offered in CNG on their website. Next one, please. So um, we'll back up just one second, Alicia, on that previous slide. I, I wanted to point out that the, uh, the, the 6.7N engine uh, is the most recent addition to the Cummins lineup. Um, and this engine is the right size engine for school buses and CNG school buses are available. Um, the folks at uh, um, Thomas built have a uh, class C school bus they recently introduced with this engine and uh, they um, uh, are now making this available uh, in addition to the uh, propane and, and electric vehicles that they have for school buses. The, um, the L9 engine was recently rebranded. It was previously the 8.9 liter engine. Uh, that was the first one they came out with. Um, and that, that engine's been the workhorse uh, for uh, most of the uh, refuse trucks and um, city buses uh, over the years. And then the um, ISX 12N uh, that came out in 2013-14 is the uh, the largest one in their lineup, as Dave um, mentioned. That uh, that's the truck that powers the Class Eight tractors that uh, can can haul the eighty thousand pound GBW. Next slide, thanks. I wanted to highlight this particular study because um, it's it's an important piece of work that was done by Cal Riverside. Even though the uh, the Cummins uh, low NOx engines are certified to 0.02 grams or 90% cleaner than the 0.2 grams of NOx. That's, that's, in, um, that's in the test uh, emissions uh, certification process. And what they found is by testing these vehicles in actual real world applications where they're um, you know, going in and out of ports, uh, stop and go traffic in, in cities and, and distribution centers idling, um, they actually found that the diesel engines that were certified to 0.2 grams are actually uh, on average emitting up to five times higher uh, NOx emissions, whereas the natural gas vehicles are actually um, emitting 90% uh, less even than the 0.02 standard they were certified to. So there's a huge difference in the real world emissions of NOx um, between the uh, natural gas uh, low NOx engines and the, the, the new clean diesel engines that are out today. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, um, price is, is a very important part of the um, analysis for any fleet. Uh, fuel costs are, um, you know, historically have been very volatile. Uh, but with natural gas, since the commodity cost of the gas is only about 23% of the total cost of CNG at the pump, compared to diesel, which is 60-70% of the total cost of the pump, uh, if there's a, a spike in the um, cost of, of uh, oil, uh, you, you're definitely going to see a huge impact at the pump. Whereas with natural gas, if the uh, commodity cost, the underlying commodity increases, it, it's not as, as apparent at, at, the, at the pump, at the total cost of CNG, because so much of it is really the fixed cost of the infrastructure and uh, maintenance on, on the infrastructure. So this is an important um, point. A lot of the, the, the large fleets that are considering alternative fuels really like this because, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, uncertainty around what fuel costs are going to be and anything they can do to 
help eliminate some of that is a big deal for them. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> we talked a little bit earlier about renewable natural gas. Um, companies like Waste Management uh, and, and others are, are deploying RNG as a uh, substitute for pipeline uh, natural gas and, and able to show an in increase in the reduction of their well to wheels greenhouse gas emissions uh, with, with typical landfill gas, it's up in the 80% reductions compared to diesel, and it can go carbon negative with um, certain uh, types of uh, agricultural waste, RNG from uh, ag waste digesters. Uh, last year, the uh, amount of RNG used in uh, natural gas vehicles in this country increased to 53% of the total amount used. So there's, there's a lot of it and a lot more coming online. So if you want to learn more about RNG, um, go to the Clean Cities uh, Georgia events page. We did an RNG uh, seminar back in May, and there's a recording and I believe a PowerPoint presentation there with a lot of great information on RNG. I encourage you to check that out. Next slide, please. Atlanta Gaslight has been providing for RNG for our customers for many years. Uh, um, about 10 years ago, we filed the TS1 rate that allows us to take uh, what we call high BTU gas or, or pipeline quality gas into our system from projects like uh, landfill gas RNG plants. And to enable the delivery of that gas to market, uh, we also have a, a separate TS2 rate where we are able to transport gas that is, is um, cleaned up enough to uh, inject it into a dedicated pipeline, delivered from point A to point B, but it's uh, uh, not necessarily cleaned up enough to uh, inject into our system. So there's no interconnection. Uh, it's just a dedicated standalone pipeline that as a separate service we, we can also provide. Next slide, please. So getting to the um, CNG fueling infrastructure discussion, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of different uh, fuels, considerations, options uh, for providing for CNG fueling. Um, one of the first and most important decisions is to consider uh, whether you can do time fill or if you need to do fast fill or some combination of both. Uh, time fill uh, is where you have the vehicles parked overnight anyway, and it's a more cost-effective, efficient way to fuel them over time or over say 10, 12 hours overnight. Um, I've noted that both uh, city furniture and waste management are, are using this approach. Uh, there's a lot of advantages. Um, for one thing, you can typically downsize the amount of uh, CNG compression you need because you are filling over an extended period of time. Um, you, it also reduces the maintenance on the compressors since they're not gonna start and stop as much which puts wear and uh, tear on the components. Um, you have um, the opportunity potentially to use some off-peak electricity. Uh, some utilities offer uh, lower cost uh, electricity if you wait until after 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. to start up your compressors. And then last but not least, you, you tend to get a fuller fill um, because you don't have as much of the heat of compression um, when you're fueling a CNG vehicle. And so you can get more like 90% of the total um, tank capacity uh, versus say about 80%. Uh, so you get more range out of the same, same tank uh, when you're doing the time fill uh, than compared to fast fill. Now, of course, a lot of fleets uh, may not be able to do time fills, not how they use their vehicles. And in that case, then you, you design the station uh, uh, for filling the vehicles on the fast fill basis, we call it, uh, or more or less the same amount of time as it would take to fuel a, a diesel or gasoline vehicle. And then of course, it's very important to understand what your vehicle arrival and fueling patterns are. Can you make decisions to ask your team to fill up, half of them fill up in the morning before they leave and the other half in the afternoon when they come in? That can make a big difference. Everybody's trying to fill up, at, 8, 8 a.m. in the morning before they head out, and you've got to design a higher horsepower, higher CFM capacity station to fast fill those vehicles. Um, then other considerations, do you need backup 
um, redundant compressors, um, you're running bifuel vehicles, maybe not. Dedicated, possibly so. Uh, are you going to open your station up for others? Do you need a fuel management system? Uh, if you're going to sell it to others, then you would need metered dispensers, uh, fuel management system. If you're not, then maybe not. Uh, and then as far as the location of the station goes, you know, you could co-locate with another fleet somewhere, um, work with a local um, truck stop or gas station to add CNG at their site. Uh, maybe you want to have a private station for your own use behind the fence, but uh, you want to make it available to others in the area as a, as a service or, or to help drive some throughput to your station and, and, and um, uh, share some of that fixed cost over a larger volume. In that case, you could have a dispenser on the outside of the fence um, and, uh, and sell fuel to other fleets in the area. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a schematic of a um, fast fuel station on top. As, as, you, as you know, the, the gas comes in uh, via pipeline. There's a dryer to reduce the moisture content uh, per code and then the compression. Uh, in a fast fuel station, you typically have a, a fair amount of storage. Um, most of the gas is, is uh, delivered uh, coming in, you're compressing it as you use it, but you, you do have storage to facilitate a, a, a orderly transfer and uh, fast fill um, fueling of the vehicles and to provide some buffer uh, for the, store, the compressor operations. Uh, at the bottom of the time fill station schematic shows that uh, you really you don't have storage, um, you, or maybe you, you only have a small vessel, uh, but you're, you're basically compressing the gas directly into the vehicles uh, overnight, and uh, the, the time fill posts and hoses, uh, as you see on, on the right there, um, is where the vehicles will connect to. The drivers come in and, and plug in the vehicle and, uh, and then walk away. Come back in the morning, the vehicle's full. So Actually, that's another advantage of time fill. You don't have as much um, time where your drivers are, are queuing up, trying to fuel somewhere. Uh, there's some labor savings there that, that can actually be very material. Next slide, please. So our, our service offering uh, for our customers at Atlanta Gaslight for CNG is, is primarily our V52 rate. We have a, a rate uh, where we and build on and maintain the CNG station for customers. We'll work with the customer to design the type of station that meets their needs. Uh, the customer typically provides the land and does any site development, uh, but we'll come in and, and, and install the infrastructure and we'll be the partner behind the scenes to uh, uh, build on and maintain the, the fueling infrastructure. We're not, we're not actually making the CNG and selling the CNG. We're, we're uh, enabling the customer to make their own CNG with the equipment we provide. Uh, so they would um, post any retail sales price that they want to. If they're going to be selling to others, um, they would pay the electric bill and, and uh, the gas bill separately. But we would um, recover our costs for the infrastructure and comprehensive maintenance, 24-hour uh, service and repairs on the infrastructure through a simple one and a half percent per month um, uh, monthly facilities charge. Next slide, please. Th this is an example of, of how that rate would be applied, a very um, simplistic example, just assuming a nice round number of uh, $2 million station, 30,000 gasoline gallon equivalents per month. And then based on recent gas prices delivered into the meter, uh, you're running about 50 cents thereabout per gallon. And as you can see on the second line, the V52 facilities charge, in this case, with the 30,000 uh, GGEs per month example, that works out to about a dollar per GGE. However, for that same station, you could put maybe 60,000 GGEs through that, in which case the math would work out for this line item would only be 50 cents per GGE. So maybe as low as a buck 10 uh, per gallon. So Again, this illustrates the point I was making earlier that, you know, the, the throughput on the, inf on the infrastructure is an important consideration. Uh, this example also does not include the 50 cent per gallon um, alternative fuels tax credit that Rodney mentioned. 
uh, that could also uh, come into play. Here's an example of uh, one of the stations we built for one of our customers, um, the Cab County, another Clean Cities Georgia board member, uh, has uh, in the order of 300 CNG vehicles now, and uh, this is a, this is a, a really successful project. This particular station we built for them in Decatur, at their central transfer facility, uh, is um, one of the uh, public stations in the Atlanta area. Next one, please. A second example of uh, this, the station we built for the city of Augusta at their, um, this is the second one they developed. We built this one for them under turnkey construction project. And, um, and we do the maintenance for them. It's a public station right off of uh, I-20 and Bobby Jones Expressway. Next one, please. So if you want to know where the public CNG stations are, the Department of Energy's Alternative Fuel Data Center includes a, uh, a station locator for alternative fuel stations. You can uh, go to this link and click on locate stations, put in CNG in your zip code, and it will show you where, where all the public stations are. And here's a map of the stations in Georgia. Uh, there's some 25 public stations in Georgia. Um, uh, at least that many of uh, private stations as well that are not shown on the map. Um, this is um, a map that includes the stations that others have developed. Um, it's not just the Atlanta Gaslight stations, but um, we provide this to fleet operators so they know where all the CNG stations are. Next slide, please. Thank you. The um, Federal Highway Administration has a, uh, a program where they um, have uh, been encouraging the development of a alternative fuel vehicle uh, corridors network for alternative fuel vehicles. And um, the map shown here is the current, uh, in the green is the, um, the CNG ready uh, corridors. We just recently submitted, Lane Cities does a lot of work on this, uh, the, application and got I-95 designated as CNG ready based on the stations in Jacksonville and, and the stations in Savannah now. Uh, so basically this enables um, people to know that there are CNG stations every 150 miles along these highlighted routes. And also the, the intent is that when infrastructure dollars become available through some of the federal funding uh, that's being discussed for alternative fuels, uh, the, the CNG and other alternative fuel corridors would be uh, the first in line for any, any funding for additional stations. And we're also working with the um, uh, state uh, folks to try to get some signage uh, uh, up on these stations as well, on these corridors as well. Next slide, please. So I'm going to wrap up just briefly with a couple of slides on uh, some of the equipment that we actually represent. Um, the uh, larger compressor packages that we install um, are typically uh, the aerial compressors packaged by either Angie or um, JW Power. But we also have been a distributor for Bauer compressors for many years. Uh, Bauer manufactures um, the compressors on the smaller end of the range. Uh, but they have some unique um, equipment. Uh, the um, X-Fill uh, package you see on the left, we've installed in a number of locations at our service centers and for some of our customers. Um, it's a, a compressor that actually uh, mounts on top of the storage. So if you've got limited space, it's, uh, it helps to uh, develop a very compact uh, footprint for a, a new CNG station. Next slide, please. On the um, uh, even smaller end of the range, uh, there's a company named Fuelmaker that makes CNG fueling appliances. These are small time fill um, units that you could install for five or $6,000. So if you're on a limited budget and you've got um, a location where you've only got a handful of vehicles, but you want to um, deploy CNG, uh, this provides some options. Uh, and there's also a company uh, named Ingevity who has 
uh, manufactured or, or developed a uh, low pressure absorption uh, CNG storage system for light, light to medium duty vehicles. And Jevity is also one of our board members here at Clean Cities Georgia. So I want to mention their work and the fact that they have worked with Fuelmaker to develop a modified version of this FMQ time fill unit. So it's set up for fueling the vehicles to the 900 PSI that they're running. Uh, in their um, activated carbon uh, storage uh, system. And this, this system actually enables you to store essentially the same amount of fuel on this, in the same tank, on the same size tank, uh, but at 900 PSI instead of 3,600 PSI, which provides a lot of benefits in terms of reducing costs for fueling uh, of, of the vehicles. And uh, the FMQ2, 900 PSI version is available uh, through Ingevity. So I wanted to mention that as well. And I think that is it. Um, uh, for more information on uh, CNG fueling infrastructure, anything that uh, Atlanta Gaslight can do for you. And again, thank you very much, um, Alicia and Frank, for putting this together. Appreciate the time today. Thank you, Ian. To Alicia, for and Frank for um, Q&A session. Hey, thank you, Ian, and thank you to uh, Dawn and, and Dave and uh, Rodney and um, uh, Alicia for helping us to, to kick this off. And uh, uh, I'm gonna, uh, Ian, I know you just went off camera, but I'm going to propose this question to Ian and David and, and Rodney. Um, you, you know, a lot of information was shared about designing systems and about how uh, small companies and large companies have adopted the natural gas technology. It's it's not new technology. It's not uh, it's not in testing stage. It's it's out there. It's available. Uh, it's beyond that. It's it's no longer early adopter status anymore. So it, it is uh, business as as normal for some companies. Um, but the thought of someone starting out a small company evaluating whether they want it to uh, enter into the natural gas space, what are the types of services that you would provide? And David, maybe you can start with you as far as looking at someone's fleet and evaluating trips and routes and duty cycles and stuff like that. What kind of support do you guys provide, David and, and Ian or, or Rodney? Let's start with David. That's a great question, Frank. Um, one of the things that we do is sit down with the fleet and understand how they operate. Secondly, take that information, that data, and do an analysis to see, does it make sense? Will the increased capital investment be offset in a reasonable period of time by the reduced operating expenses? And so we model various scenarios with various vehicles and various scales over time to make sure it makes sense. Uh, at Peach State, I do that primarily, and there is no charge. We're always happy to do that. Even for a fleet that's out of state, such as Florida, if you wanted some help to begin the modeling process, reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you with that. Thank you, David. And, and Ian, Frank, I know that... Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, just, just to add to what David said, I think uh, just to kind of emphasize, you know, you know, really for the municipals that we work with, going in and, and identifying uh, fleet opportunities even outside the municipal. So you've got the municipal that has a fleet, the county, and so you've got uh, you know other potential fleet operators there that are, are within the within the municipal jurisdiction. And so so to me that's critical because that really gets to what David was talking about in terms of infrastructure investment. I mean, how how big does it need to be? Does it need to be private? Does it need to be public? And so we, we we've seen startups that move right into a public operation because of the, of the committed GGEs uh, to a project. Thank you. And Ian, I, I know you the, the great footprint, what you've done in Georgia, but obviously Florida, to our Florida friends, you've got natural gas providers in Florida that can do the same thing or, or comparable to what uh, Atlanta Gaslight is doing in Florida. Don, I know you've got a great network of uh, Florida natural gas providers, but Ian, um, that assessment of where to start, how to build a station, maybe building a station is not the right step, right? It, it might be trying to find a public station nearby to, maybe it's using one of uh, waste management's uh, public stations and kind of making that commitment to buy fuel from them. Oh, 
You're on mute, Ian. Yeah, that helps. Yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm based in Atlanta, and, and our service territory, um, for the most part, is Georgia. But we're we're happy to help. I'm happy to help uh, if anybody just wants to uh, consult with me. I I've spent many years kind of learning who all's in this space and and what um, vehicles are available, and and uh, as a board member of the National NGV America Association, and I have my finger on the pulse with what's um, coming down the line in terms of incentives and, and such. So um, happy to, to help. Um, I would defer to people like David, who are the experts in, in the field on the, the vehicle side of things. But, um, you know, we, we've been building and maintaining CNG stations for customers since the early 90s. So um, I, can, I can give a pretty good uh, representation of, of, you know, what options are available for the fueling side and uh, help them locate partners uh, in, in Florida that can assist them with that. Thank you. And, and Don, uh, waste management, obviously to be commended for the, the, the commitment to alternative fuels for many, many years and, and how you have rolled out this program nationally. I know that, you know, as a waste management customer, I know those trucks are a lot quieter. I, I know that, uh, you know, maybe it allows uh, waste management to start their routes a little bit earlier in the day and that closed loop now of collecting the waste, turning the waste into fuel, putting that fuel back into the vehicles. You guys are just to be commended. And, and obviously, you know, you, you said it, uh, waste management is a Fortune 200 company. Uh, you're, you're in business to stay in business and make money. But so obviously there has to be that return and you've got your, your CFO, uh, uh, you know, watching every penny when it comes to this kind of investment, but obviously there's a return on the investment as well. Yeah, d definitely. I mean, we, we do expect that we spend about $50,000 more per truck uh, for a comparable CNG over a diesel truck. But as many of the speakers highlighted the cost of the fuel, we see that savings. Um, we have had to retrain our, our mechanics, but that's, you know, we've been doing that for many years. That's gone well. And I think many of the speakers said our drivers, you know, like driving the trucks too. You know, they're quiet or they feel better in the community about doing that. And it's just a, a huge commitment um, on the sustainability front. We have looked at some electric vehicles. So, you know, I didn't go into that, but at this point, we're not doing a heavy buy on that. It's just, it, we don't feel electric has made the transition to the heavy, uh, truck industry yet and I think most of the speakers agreed with that as well but uh, we're doing some interesting things even on our landfills a lot of our yellow iron we're turning to electric and or CNG powered yellow iron I didn't get into that but because we're, we're it's not extensive we're also doing some remoteless yellow iron in Denver we have a site where people are off-site sitting in a room contro controlling our yellow iron and the landfill remotely. We think that's a way to attract new workers, younger workers, millennials who wouldn't necessarily work on a landfill but would love to sit in a room with a joystick moving heavy equipment. So mm -hmm. we're trying to get creative and uh, not only uh, address fuel but address our, our current and future workforce needs. Great, thank you. Alicia, I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you've got any more questions in the chat or the question section. I was going to say there is one question, Frank. Um, it says that will Clean Cities be helping with getting infrastructure grants for CNG station and electric charging stations and the new electric trucks? Well, yes, uh, we certainly will when those grants are let. Uh, there was just a recent uh, letting of grants and the applications, gosh, I think they were due this week. So uh, we know that uh, the administration had, uh, and the Department of Energy had released a significant amount of funds for different technologies and, and fuels. And we, uh, we, we monitor that. And so uh, we'll stay in touch with that. And, you know, the best way to, to know if, uh, if those grants are out is to join your local clean cities as we do announcements on those grant opportunities and we love to work with our stakeholders and members to be able to to design something and, and I think if you have something in mind you know my plug would be is uh, talk to us now so that we can have a sense of what a project might look like be, uh, before the grant is let because uh, once that hits the uh, uh, the airways if you will uh, there's not a lot of time to put uh, together the program or your grant to get it written and, and get it submitted for consideration 
and then certainly uh, pay attention to the Diesel Emissions Reduction uh, Act grants, the DERA grants that uh, can help. Um, uh, it was mentioned about school buses and about uh, replacing diesel buses with uh, propane or natural gas buses. Um, and uh, that's certainly a, a program that's available, but uh, uh, nothing available right now, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, it's still, uh, you know, we've got the second half of the year and, and um, uh, we, we uh, certainly look forward to working with anybody that's got a great idea and see if we can't refine that to be able to qualify for, for grant dollars. Thank you so much, Frank. That was actually the only question that we have. I don't know if anybody else um, that's still here, if you guys have any additional questions that you would like to ask, go ahead and please put it in the questions or the chat within the next few minutes. We still have about three minutes left. I will mention, Alicia, uh, that we, both uh, of our websites will have this um, presentation recorded and made available here in a few days on our websites if you've got more questions. And certainly, uh, if you need to get in touch with us, you've got our emails. Uh, we can connect you with uh, any of the panelists. I uh, want to thank the panelists for doing that. Dave Clevenger from uh, City Furniture. Great to see how a small company has taken this on, this, this, these baby steps that are now a pretty significant in what they've done in the state of Florida and certainly waste management. And you've got uh, partners that are willing to help you, many vendors and partners willing to help you to, to uh, move into this space. And who knows, you start with one or two trucks, uh, eventually you grow and maybe you have your own fueling station, maybe you grow into using renewable natural gas. Uh, Ian mentioned that uh, presentation that we did. And that's just kind of that evol evolution of, um, you know, a cleaner, burning fuel that uh, has uh, additional benefits as well. So I'll, I'll uh, turn it back to the panelists. Any closing comments before we wrap up? All right. Well, thank you to everyone that presented and everyone that joined and um, stay tuned for more webinars like this. Alicia, yes. thanks. Great to awesome. do this with you. All of our friends in Florida, uh, be well and, and thank you everyone. Thank you again, everyone, for joining and the panelists. Everything was great. And yes, please stay tuned for the recording and presentations to be available. Everyone have a great day. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.